The single biggest leap forward in terms of cognition and culture in our past is probably the Upper Paleolithic Revolution. Before this time, around 40,000 years ago, humans did not produce representational art. They used red ochre to create abstract designs. They used shells and feathers for personal ornamentation. They even had ritualized burials. But it never occurred to them to artistically render any of the objects of their experience. If you've dealt with small children, you know that they will pick up a crayon and doodle and draw zigzags and spirals and circles well before they will actually attempt to represent their mother or their father. Sometimes, if they're verbally competent, they will scribble and say that that's, you know, mom or whatever. Uh, But they won't actually truly attempt to artistically render something until they're quite a bit older. So it's a much more sophisticated cognitive procedure. It involves kind of abstraction. It involves a capacity for symbolic thought. After this threshold is crossed in Europe 40,000 years ago, not only are people capable of representational art, but you see some of the most sophisticated parietal and mobiliary art for thousands of years, like until relatively recent times, nobody surpassed the great European Upper Paleolithic artists. They made human figures, animal figures. They represented human-animal hybrids. There's evidence of advanced symbolism in and thematic religious motifs in these vast cave paintings. There's even direct evidence of portraiture at Dolny Vestinich. If you look at some of those figures, like nothing equals it until the Egyptians in terms of portraiture. So something big changed. Not only that, but they developed bone needles and started weaving fine textiles. They developed ropes and large nets that they used in hunting. They were fishing. Their subsistence toolkit greatly expanded. They could make more out of their local environment, increase their population. It was a huge leap forward. I think a bigger leap forward than the leap into the Neolithic, which I also think was hugely significant. In the past, I've explained this leap forward by appealing to Homo sapiens sapiens, Homo sapiens neanderthalensis admixture. Neanderthals had big brains, bigger than Homo sapiens at the time, but human beings, you know, Homo sapiens sapiens, rapidly developed their toolkits. They changed the forms of their tools. Neanderthals were very conservative. They didn't really change their tools much. So some portion of this admixed population got the neurocortical development of Homo sapiens and the development of the cere- uh, cerebellum, rather, from the Neanderthals. They got the best of both worlds. And suddenly, within a couple generations, there was this group of people that was a standard deviation or more, more intelligent than anyone who had ever existed. Very possibly. That's been my kind of working hypothesis. But there is another reason we should expect a huge leap forward cognitively at exactly that time. And that is the introduction of musical instruments in the archaeological record. We find in the Swabian Alps in southern Germany, around 37,000 years ago approximately, bone flutes bird bone flutes that are tuned to the pentatonic scale. Interesting that it is the pentatonic scale, the major pentatonic to be specific, because that is the scale that ends up being used in pretty much all folk music around the world. And um, even much of modern pop music is based on the pentatonic collection. That's the black keys on the keyboard. 
And that is the scale that you would naturally discover if you discovered the most consonant interval after the octave and the unison, the perfect fifth. So tonic, perfect fifth, mm, mm. That's the most consonant interval outside of unison. Um, if you keep doing that five times, go up the circle of fifths five times, and then compress all of those notes back down into one octave, you have the major pentatonic collection. I'm not saying that's how these Cromanians discovered it, but I mean, we shouldn't rule anything out. It may be that, you know, these primitive flutes were mechanically capable of producing this collection and they were experimenting with it and they found something that sounded pretty good. So maybe that was it. But in any case, um, this has huge consequences because there is exactly one activity that you can expose your children to at an early age that has been proved to increase their IQ permanently. Of course, that is learning a musical instrument. You can teach them the abacus, you can take them to gymnastics class and whatever else you want to do with them. I'm sure that's all well and good, but it won't increase their IQ. There is one way that we know of to increase a person's IQ permanently. Uh, I mean, as an adult, you can take a bunch of IQ tests and improve the scores that you get, but there is one way to improve the general factor of intelligence itself. That is learning a musical instrument at an early age. If you're over the age of 12, it's probably not going to help you very much. But if you have young children, you better teach them a musical instrument or pay to have them taught because that is a huge difference. Um, yeah, I didn't say it's a 10% difference. It's not a small difference. It's almost a standard deviation, depending on where the baseline is. It's a standard deviation increase in intelligence. Um, you're talking about like $10,000 or more in terms of predicted lifelong uh, annual earnings. Um, I'm not sure exactly what it is in monetary terms, but it's a huge payoff if you get your kids music lessons. So these Cromanians started learning musical instruments. They would have received this benefit. So not only perhaps did this admixture increase their cognitive ability, but then immediately after that, they had this technology that the people who invested in it all of a sudden got way smarter. And uh, musical instruments are associated with the shamanic tradition in Siberia. People often say that uh, shamanic tribal society in Siberia is the closest thing to the original Upper Paleolithic European societies. I think that's right. And the shamans are usually the most accomplished musicians. They use musical instruments in their rituals. And that's probably what went on even in the Aragnation phase, the earliest phase of the Upper Paleolithic in Europe. So this would have given a certain subset of people a huge advantage socially and cognitively. This would have set up a sexual selective regime that itself favored higher intelligence because the kind of people who are naturally good at musical instruments are also generally intelligent themselves. So, yeah, that's interesting. There are other times through history where a musical innovation came just before a huge uh, cultural upgrade. Ancient Greek music was very sophisticated. Even before Pythagoras, they had a tuning system that was microtonal. They were aware of the quarter tone. Most folk tr music traditions don't get that far. They had many different modes. They were able to modulate between different modes. Um, that's not a trivial thing. Again, most folk traditions start in one mode and they end in that same mode. Even Hindustani music begins in one rag, ends in the same rag. So, yeah, um, the Greeks were very advanced musically. And it's not clear how much of an advantage this would have given them. You know, in Athens... It was mandated that you receive a music education if you were going to be a citizen. 
So if all the Athenian citizens were trained in music at an early age, you're talking about the entire like political population being about 10% smarter than it otherwise would have been on the basis of a really good policy. Um, so maybe we should emulate that. But Pythagoras is famous for his contributions to music. He discovered the actual numerical ratios that are involved in these intervals. So the perfect fifth, aforementioned, is two over three. The perfect fourth is three over four. The major third is five over four, etc. And he also developed the Pythagorean system of tuning and the Pythagorean scale. He's also said to have been an accomplished musician himself. And actually, there are stories where he was able to control people's emotions using music, scientifically. Like someone would be becoming enraged, and he would know exactly what notes to play to calm them down. There are also stories that he was able to heal people physically with his music. You know, the Greek, um, you know, uh, medical science believed that there was a correspondence between soul and body. So by kind of tapping into that, Pythagoras could influence a person's soul with the music, and that would correspondingly influence their body. Hippocrates believed there was this soul-body correspondence. And Plato believed that the essence of the soul was in some sense, essentially musical. If you read the Timaeus, when the Demiurge creates the world soul, and our souls are created in a similar way a little bit later on, the Demiurge takes a few forms first from the realm of forms, the form of being, usia, the form of the same, and the form of the other, and he blends those together. And it's tricky because the other wants to resist and, you know, go its own way, but eventually he forces it in there and he stretches out this mixture and recombines it in very particular ratios. Um, and those ratios are these numerical ratios that Pythagoras discovered. So the structure, the essence of the soul is composed of the same intervals that make up music as we know it. The soul is essentially musical. Schopenhauer believed that music is the only art form that doesn't represent our representational modalities, you know, the field of representation, but represents our will directly. It is the truest manifestation of our nature in art. So music has a very special place among the arts for Schopenhauer. <sighs> Um, so I think there's something to that. Otherwise, how do you explain the effect that music has on people's emotions? Like, how is it that 12 keys, major, minor chords, augmented, diminished, half diminished, like they have a very predictable effect on a person's emotions. That's why musical scores for films, you know, film scores are able to tell the emotional story and inform what's going on emotionally in the picture. Um, like, how is it able to do that? <laughs> There's no scientific explanation of why these particular sounds should have this particular emotional effect. Um, I think it is because there's something that is resonating in us in our soul with music. So we have to be careful about the kind of music that we engage with. Uh, Pythagoras made these innovations <laughs> and obviously it helped him cognitively. He developed also a huge amount of mathematics. Um, he developed the system of pedagogy, the quadrivium, that lasted about 2,300 years, no one could think of a better way to do teaching people than what Pythagoras came up with. So, clearly, there is this correlation between a musical development and a general cognitive development. 
The same is true of European Faustian civilization. We developed acoustics to a mathematically rigorous science. We developed a system of music notation. There were other systems going pretty far back, but they were all relatively primitive. Our system of notation was robust. It allowed for very complex compositions. So it's the equivalent of like developing writing for the first time in musical terms. That's what we did. And uh, very quickly, uh, these German mathematicians outstripped the ancient Pythagoreans and all the ancient Greeks. The history of math, by the way, is basically like what the Greeks did, what a couple Persians did, building on the work of the Greeks, and then what the Germans did. And then more lately, there's a couple Indians and some Jews, but like pretty much it's Greeks and Germans that make up like the vast bulk of mathematical development. And so, yeah, we develop this new system of music and then for the first time we're making major mathematical breakthroughs again. We discover the works of Plato again. You know, the Renaissance happens. We develop the most advanced science and technology the world has ever seen, um, the most powerful civilization the world has ever seen. I'm not saying it's only because of the music that that happened, but in terms of causes of sudden onset cognitive development, it's the leading candidate. It should be considered. So there is this correlation, and music doesn't just have the capacity to increase our performance, it can also decrease our performance. They've done studies on rats where they raise young rats listening to music 12 hours a day, different genres of music. So some of the rats will get classical music, some will get heavy metal, some will get soft rock, and then there's a control group of silence. And after a couple weeks, they run these rats through mazes and the control group does the best. The rats raised in silence do the best. After that though, and at every future test, the classical music group outperforms everybody consistently. The heavy metal group, I'm sorry to say, underperforms the control group so their ability to perform on these mazes is decreased by constant exposure to this rhythmically complex, harmonically dissident, or not dissident, dissonant, uh, gosh, uh, dissonant, <laughs> dissonant music. The word is too close. So, you know, I know that's a hard pill to swallow if you're a big metal fan, but the evidence seems to suggest that Listening to heavy metal music does not help your cognitive performance, but hurts it. Now you might say, yeah, fine. Maybe, you know, listening to Mozart is going to give you a bigger cognitive boost, but it'll increase your testosterone. And that's what I care about. I listen to metal music when I'm at the gym. And, you know, to be honest, the uh, evidence there is mixed. Look into it. It seems that uh, there's some indication that among males, listening to violent music actually decreases testosterone. And in females, increases it. So the opposite of what you would want in both cases. Um, it's not ubiquitous that this is the result people get. But we should be thinking scientifically about what kind of music we're listening to and what effects it is having on us. I think... Pythagoras was onto something when he discovered he was able to heal people with music. We can hurt people with music and we can heal people with music. You know, people thought rock and roll was of the devil. I think that's right. I think all the major genres of popular music do more harm than good. And people love their contemporary music, but you know what? People love a lot of things that are bad for them. It doesn't mean it's actually beneficial. Somewhere in the Republic... Socrates says, the useful is the noble, the hurtful is the base, and that should be the standard of aesthetics. Clearly, that was Plato's standard. That's why he restricted the number of musical modes he would allow. And the medieval monks that developed the most advanced system of music theory the world has ever seen... They agreed with Plato, they followed Plato's advice, and they carefully considered every interval 
whether this motion was acceptable, whether this variety of contrary motion or parallel motion was acceptable, and not just because it sounds good. They were thinking about what is wholesome, healthy, and godly, and they avoided things that were symbolically associated with evil. We don't do that. In heavy metal music, there's often strong associations with the satanic. That's not an accident. And it may well be addictive. You may well like that kind of music. And I'm sure there are people, you know, in the comments right now saying, you know, well, but this subgenre of melodic metal from Norway is actually really good. And like, I agree with you, most metal music is bad. Okay, I'm not going to believe that until you show me the rat study. Raise some rats listening to your preferred variety of metal and I'll reconsider my opinion. But, you know, so these monks are carefully considering these things at the theological level for centuries. They're developing this. And it doesn't stop there. It's not just the medieval sacred music that had these kind of hang-ups about certain intervals and forms of motion. You know, it, it waxes and wanes. You know, interestingly, in the Renaissance, uh, in the era of the Madrigal, you have much more ex exploration of different musical modes under the influence of this kind of Grecian reintroduction of the Grecian music theory. They re-explore all of these different musical modes, and they have some very complex harmony, like uh, Carlo Gesualdo, kind of infamous Renaissance composer, um, wrote some of the most complex harmony that existed until the 19th century, like centuries ahead of his time in terms of complexity. But also, he killed his family. He was a murderer. I'm not going to say that was necessarily causal, but, I mean, <laughs> what, do you, what do you expect when you don't follow Plato's advice, when you explore all of these various dissonant modes and... Uh, you know, rhythmic complexity. <sighs> um, yeah, so we have to be careful about what we use. So the Renaissance explored a bunch of different modes, and then, you know, Baroque music became, you know, with the onset of, like, the scientific revolution, when people be began actually caring about the truth for real, like, legit, started discovering things, um, in a rigorous way, uh, then they reined back the music and stuck to like major and minor, two modes, just like Plato recommends, two modes that they explore and they like systematize the counterpoint and they hold off on some of these polyrhythms and like, you know, adventurous stuff that's happening with the Renaissance. But later on in um, especially Germany, they develop... Uh, in sacred music, a very robust system of um, like motivic principles, what motives should be used at what occasion and to, to what effect. So this is the doctrine of affect, the effect in Lehre. Um, really, it should be the effect in Lehren because there were ver like various systems in different principalities in Germany. But, uh, you know, they used theological principles and even absolute music came to have programmatic qualities because these narrative gestures, uh, like theological principles were associated with certain musical motifs, like the descending scale would be like a uh, divine energy uh, descending and by thirds would mean something different. And it was very technical and, you know, different principles were held, upheld in different places but it had a really big impact. And that's not the kind of thing you just like bump into by accident. Like if you're composing your own music on your own and you're not tied to a tradition like this, what are the odds that you're going to be like theologically sound, let alone wholesome and actually like improving people's IQ by listening to you? It's, you know, I think we should be a lot more careful about what kind of music we promote. And it's a tough subject because people are emotionally attached to music, as I said, you know, as they should be, because it is attached to our soul in a deep way. Schopenhauer said that the different aspects of music reflect different aspects of the human being. So like the melody reflects intellect, 
It's diverse in its motions. It goes here and there, but it's thematically unified, just like a discourse. And of course, harmony is associated with emotion. That's why musical scores are generally minimalistic in terms of melody, except with like that special moment when attention is called to the music and then the big theme plays. Um, but generally, in the background, it's these harmonic shifts that tell the emotional story and you know pull us in. And then rhythm is associated with the body. And it's telling that over the 20th century, rhythm came to dominate everything else. In pop music, I mean, the, the instruments <laughs> began to be referred to as the rhythm section, even though there would be pianos and saxophones and guitars and, you know, all sorts of melodic and harmonic instruments. It was all the rhythm section. And that's what people cared about. And that's what people still care about. And that's what they listen to. And you know what it's doing? It's drawing us down into the body. And the same goes for any highly syncopated, rhythmically complex music. The attention, the interest is in the rhythm that draws us into the body. And it's not even necessarily healthy for the body because complex polyrhythms in, uh, induce a state of anxiety. Like, we know this. There's been studies, again, on the influence of music on the autosomal nervous system. And we explore a lot of this stuff in music therapy, and it's becoming a science. And... You know what? You can increase people's heart rate and blood pressure and other factors, other measurable factors of the autosomal nerve system through music. Um, and you can put people in a state of anxiety and stress. And that doesn't mean that people won't like that music. People do things that are stressful all the time and they become addicted to them. People become addicted to playing video games, even when playing a video game induces a bunch of stress. They keep coming back to it probably because the release from that stress is hormonally rewarding. And so people go back and seek that experience again, not even fully understanding why. And young people listen to a ton of music, like hours and hours of dissonant, rhythmically complex, anxiety-inducing in music. And we wonder why there's a mental health crisis. Like, we are not helping with the music that we're listening to in the modern world. Even trad people will often just listen to the same degenerate modern BS that everybody else listens to. We know that classical music has a beneficial effect. You know, they've done a bunch of studies seeing what people can listen to that will like temporarily benefit their performance on a test. And time and time again, there is one composer that does better than everybody else. And it's Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Um, no one else comes close. It makes sense because Mozart, um, I don't care what your opinion is, I'm right on this. Mozart was the, far and away, the best writer of melody of all time. Um, and if you don't know why, it's because you don't understand the compositions and you don't see what he's doing. It's subtle, he's playing games with you, he is inverting, putting things in retrograde, you know, going just contrary to expectation. And he knows how to capture interest. He knows how to like keep things various and yet united, uh, diversity and, multi and uh, unity in one. No one comes close. I mean, Bach is a great musician, but no one melody by Bach compares to hardly any melody by, <laughs> by Mozart. It's, he's in a different league. Um, Respighi is good. Um, you know, there are others, but anyway, um, yeah, so it makes sense though, if melody is associated with intellect, that Mozart in particular would increase cognitive performance. And, you know, I'm, if I'm doing my top, uh, <laughs> composers in these categories, harmony goes to WC, of course, and, uh, WC makes you feel good. He knew what he was doing with Harmony. Like, who does not feel good listening to Claire de Lune? Everybody feels good. Even people who don't like classical music feel good when they listen to that music. Um, and, yeah, I'm not going to touch rhythm because it's bass. It is. And we shouldn't be emphasizing rhythm in our music. Um, and as far as we use syncopation, it should be to draw our attention to... Uh, harmonic or rhythmic motifs and it should frame and subserve 
the interests of intellect, just like the body should serve intellect, appetite should serve intellect in the Platonic worldview. So uh, there has been a science of what music is beneficial. We have considered this, and we forgot all of it and thought suddenly that music should be self-expression, music should be what makes you feel good or what draws your attention or what's exciting or basically no standards, just whatever goes as far as music goes. And I went to Eastman, one of the big conservatories in the U.S., and I mean, they had this same postmodern relativism that everybody else has. I don't know if the same is true at a place like Curtis or Juilliard, but by now I'm sure it is. And nobody's preserving this. And I don't think there's a soul alive who understands the full extent of what this implies. Like, um, music can set a civilization forward and give it this huge leap forward and make it the most powerful thing out there. It can lead to all these other developments, or it can lead a civilization to come crashing down like ours. I'm not saying music is the only factor, but uh, we need to consider all the factors. We need to reconsider our lifestyle from the top down, especially the music. So um, another thing, by the way, like not all classical music is the same. As I said, like Mozart does better in increasing cognitive performance, but he also existed in an age when the musicians were sensitive to the intonation in a way that modern musicians aren't. You know, professional orchestral musicians will temper intervals to make them closer to the just intonation version, the, you know, the pure ratios involved. So in an orchestra, like they will slightly raise the perfect fifth compared to equal temperament. They will slightly lower or somewhat more lower the major third, specifically by a comma. Um, so, yeah, I mean, people still know how to do this. But when you listen to piano music or electronic music, um, guitar music, people are not making these adjustments. So most of the music you listen to today is just equal temperament, which means they uh, basically divide up the scale completely evenly, uh, which mathematically uses uh, the square root of two, which uh, if the Pythagoreans found out about that, they would be furious. Um, but yeah, like it's none of the intervals except the octaves on a piano are actually pure. There are no interval is in tune except the octave in equal temperament. And that's what we're always listening to. We're always listening to music that is out of tune. And even like in band programs, like people don't really understand the subtleties of intonation. That's why so many <laughs> high school and middle school bands sound like crap because they're not playing in tune. They don't know how. If anything, they approximate to equal temperament because like, oh, well, the tuner says I'm in tune. The tuner is tuned to equal temperament. So that doesn't tell you anything. Um, you know, the old systems of tuning, the mean tone systems, would correct for a kind of natural flaw that exists in the circle of fifths. Um, it's hard to develop a perfect system of intonation. In fact, it's impossible. There is no perfect system of intonation because mathematically, the world we live in doesn't work that way. If you go around the circle of fifths and get back to your starting note, you're slightly sharp of where you left. So it doesn't quite line up. Um, which means if you want to fit it all together on a keyboard and have the octaves be in tune with each other, you have to lower the perfect fifth somewhat. Equal temperament does that by a very small amount. The uh, mean tone systems would also lower the perfect fifths by somewhat more. And there were different amounts by which they lower these fifths to arrive at uh, you know, a, a kind of pleasing set of mathematical ratios. Some of the ratios would end up being closer, though, by using mean tone systems to the pure ratios than equal temperament. And they would kind of fudge with it and find the best combination. So you would have like a pure major third, a pure major sixth. Um, you would have pure particular intervals. 
and actually certain keys on a piano or a forte piano would be more in tune and would include more pure intervals than other keys. So there was kind of color to actually changing keys. The keys were qualitatively different, which gave more subtlety. But the most important thing is that the variety of semitone was different. <laughs> um, there, you know, a correct semitone depended on where in the scale it was occurring and where harmonically it was occurring. So there was a major semitone that was larger and there was a minor semitone that was smaller. They differed by, again, one comma. A comma is the distance of intonation between a Pythagorean third and a, um, a mean tone third that's adjusted. You don't have to understand all of that. The point is, in learning correct intonation principles, like learning how to play with just intonation, which is just like constantly adjusting your intonation to always map onto the perfect ratios. And by doing that, you're going to uh, like fluctuate where the tonic is. So t the tonic itself will move slightly, which is fine because most people don't have perfect pitch. They're listening with relative pitch. And so they don't really notice that you've kind of adjusted. Uh, bands and choirs often do this. Like when they end, they're like even a half step down from where they began sometimes. But it doesn't, we don't notice that. We notice the, the relative intervals. So what matters is that people learned how to like attend to these microtonal differences, differences of a comma, which is like one fifth of a semitone. That's a very small difference to attune to. And people were trained specifically when to apply a comma sharper or a comma sh uh, flatter semitone, whole tone. Um, and this is just lost. Like, I never heard about this stuff in Eastman. I had to learn about this on my own way after the fact. What kind of cognitive influence do you think comes from listening and performing music that strives after the, these pure intervals? This, I think, is why Plato says the intelligible music is noble, but like just playing and listening to the heard acoustical music is not as important. It's because we need to know those intelligible ratios and strive after as close to perfection as is humanly possible to really get what we can get out of music. The Greeks had microtones in their music. Traditional Western classical music had microtonal elements. It's just, they didn't emphasize that. That was just how the intonation system worked. So this is like very little understood stuff and I think it would make a huge difference in terms of cognition and development. You know, when they say learning an instrument boosts your IQ by 10%, sure, but what if we taught like correct Baroque music principles to young kids? What if we taught them right instead of raising them on equal temperament pianos and, and everything else that goes with that and, and pop music and everything else? Like we really, I hope I'm, I'm spending a lot of time on this because I think it's hugely important. Like, if I was the dictator of the U.S., one of my biggest priorities would be implementing, implementing mass music education ages 3 through 12. And it, we would scientific, there would be research programs to scientifically engineer the most cognitively uh, and physically beneficial uh, music pedagogy. That's what it will take to restart our civilization. Probably our civilization's doomed. We're going to have to rebuild it. And we are going to have to think correctly about these sorts of principles. Rethink our music. Rethink our poetry. Rethink our architecture. Exactly as Plato says in the Republic. So, hopefully, my point is clear in this. I don't mean any offense to metal fans. And maybe there is some variety of, you know... <sighs> Uh, melodic thrash Norwegian woods metal something that is you know healthy I don't know I hope so but we should test it and we shouldn't just assume it the same goes for our alt uh, electronic uh, wave you know vapor wave whatever it is it's not necessarily good for us it's not necessarily good for our children and uh, we really have to get this straight the safest thing to do is simply to learn classical music um, if you want to take piano lessons with me, you can do that. Contact me on Skype. 
I really care about this, you know, and one day I'd like to actually, you know, start a music education program with uh, Peer Academy, with the school project, but, you know, resources don't allow at the moment and, you know, it makes sense for me to focus on the Platonism and other stuff in the meantime. But let me know what you think about this topic. Yeah, I think it's super important. I haven't talked about it much, but yeah, uh, it's not a trivial thing. It's a quadrivial thing. <laughs> you know, it's important. It's at the core of education. Music theory was in the quadrivium of Pythagoras. Um, we need both the trivium and the quadrivium, and we need those classical principles because they knew way more than we understand. You know, they, we've lost so much, especially in the musical dimension. Um, music therapy is promising. You know, we should really pursue that. It's not that we only have to go back to classical music. It's just we have to be scientific. We have to be seeking health and intellect, wisdom, and God with our music. So that's a tall order, but you know, consider that the next time you sit down at the guitar or piano. God bless. Thank you for listening.